Matthew, for the invitation. Uh, I'm a great fan of the RSA and a long-time fellow. Um, and I'm delighted to know that my uh, talk here has been the most popular download. No, I was saying the TED video has been downloaded four million times. Uh, my son showed me a video recently on YouTube uh, of two kittens uh, who seem to be having a conversation. It's 90 seconds long, and that's been downloaded 17 million times. <laughs> So I'm not getting carried away with myself, really. I just, if only I had looked cute for 90 seconds, <laughs> my fame would be even greater. I just want to say a few words about this book, because the real value of today is that we're a small enough group to have a conversation, and I would really value that. I was asked recently how long it took to write this book, and there are two answers to that. One of them is eight months, six to eight months, and the other is 35 years. Because this book is about something I feel passionately about and have done most of my professional life. Uh, actually, longer than that even, uh, most of my unprofessional life. And the, the core idea really is that, it, certainly in my experience, most adults have no idea of their true talents. No idea of what they're really capable of achieving. Most adults, in my experience, kind of bump along the bottom. You know, they, they do something they feel perhaps more or less competent in, things they feel they need to do, but don't do with any great uh, passion or commitment or any great sense of fulfillment. I don't say this is true of you, um, and I can't prove the statistics of this. I'm just saying it's been my experience. I meet people time and again. And yet I also meet people who absolutely love what they do and couldn't really imagine doing anything else. That when they discovered this thing, for them it was a turning point, and they, th you know, that this, this is what their life has become. So I've long been interested in what the difference is, and what makes the difference. And the book is therefore based on a whole series of interviews uh, with people about how they got to be, so to speak, in their element. I heard myself saying this a lot, you know, that people do their best uh, when they do something they love, when they're in their element. And I thought, well, what is it? quite to be in your element. And I think it's two things. One of them is that if you're on your element, you're doing something for which you have a natural capacity, a natural feel. And it's different for all sorts of people. It's different for all of us, really. Um, one of the people in the book is a guy called Terence Tao. I didn't have the pleasure of meeting him, but his story is quite well known, and we included it. Uh, Terence Tao, have you heard of Terence Tao, any of you? He's a professor of mathematics in UCLA. At the age of two, he taught himself to read from Sesame Street. So a rather quirky accent uh, in, the, in the case of Terence, and uh, rather too feathered for most people's taste, really. <laughs> um, and then at the age of three, he was uh, uh, completing double-digit equations. I don't know what they are, by the way, but he was doing it at three. Uh, at the age of eight, he took a college entrance exam in mathematics and got 97%. At the age of 20, he got his PhD in maths, and at the age of 30, he got the Field Medal, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Mathematics, and the MacArthur Genius Award. It's reasonable to say that Terence gets maths. You know? <laughs> Terence got the hang of maths, frankly, uh, in a way that most of us have not. Um, uh, I realized recently, I was born in 1950. That's not what I realized recently. I knew that. I've, <laughs> I, I have known that for some time now. Uh, in fact, since 1950. Uh, so I'm a kind of boomer, kind of. Um, and I realized recently that I was given a guitar as a teenager around the same time that Eric Clapton got his first guitar. It worked out for Eric, you know, in a, <laughs> in a way it is yet to work out for me. So part of this is having a natural aptitude, kind of knowing what this thing is um, and taking to it. But being good at something being naturally good at something is not enough to be in your element, as I see it. To be in your element, you also have to love it. Um, I know lots of people who are doing things they're good at that they don't greatly care for. They do it because they're good at it. I wrote a book um, 
in the 80s, and the editor who worked on the book is a wonderful woman. Uh, she used to be a concert pianist. And uh, I was rather surprised by this when she told me, and I said, How, you know, what happened? And she said she was doing a concert, giving a concert at the Purcell Room on the South Bank uh, one evening. And at the end of it, the conductor took her for dinner and said, you were great this evening. She said, thank you. He said, but you didn't enjoy it, did you? And she said, how do you mean? He said, well, you didn't enjoy it. She said, what? He said, well, playing. You didn't seem to enjoy it. She said, well, no, not really. And he said, well, do you enjoy playing? She said, um, no, not really. He said, well, why do you do it? She said, well, because I'm good at it, I suppose. And he said, you know, being good at something is not a good enough reason to do it. And she realized that what had happened was she'd spent her entire life meeting other people's expectations. You know, that she'd shown a precocious talent as a pianist. She went to um, uh, a specialist music school. Then she went to the Royal College of Music. And then she did a doctor music degree. And then she did a, um, and then she progressed to the concert platform. And she said nobody had ever really stopped to ask her, and she'd never stopped to ask herself why she was doing it, except that she was good at it. She just could. And said, and I realized when he put this to me that I'd never liked it. And at the end of that season, she said, I finished the season, finished my commitments, but I closed the lid of the piano, and I've never opened it since. She said, because I realized when I stopped to think about it that the thing I had always loved was books, always. I loved writers, I loved being around writers, I loved the literary world, I loved reading, I loved writing when I could. So she said, I determined that I'd find a, a role in the literary world so I could be among the people I wanted to be with and do the thing I loved to do. And she said, I've never been happier. Um, and I say this for several reasons. One is that I say, it's not enough to be good at something. And this isn't just about the art. Sometimes the arts trap people as much as anything else trap people. It's about finding the thing that resonates with you uh, most fully. Um, I've been asked a couple of things about the book. You know, they, they say, is the book about creativity? This book is not really about creativity, in, in my opinion. Um, this is a book about diversity. Um, it's about the extraordinary multiplicity of human talent, most of which, in my experience, is lost. And there are reasons why it's lost. So part of the book is describing what I mean by the element, and it's, it's that point at which natural talent meets a passion. I think when you find yourself in love with something you're good at, you never really work again, you know? Um, I remember years ago, uh, my brother used to be in a band. I'm from Liverpool, he was in a rock band. And uh, he had a fantastic keyboard player, Charles. And uh, we, I came off, went out with them one night to this gig. See? <laughs> Cutting edge, you know. <laughs> I want you to know that. Um, a gig. And we were hanging after the gig, and <laughs> chilling, so to speak. And I said, you were fantastic there tonight, Charles. He said, thank you. Uh, I said, but you didn't enjoy it. Oh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, no, I said, no, you were fantastic there tonight, weren't you? He said, yes, I was. And <laughs> I said, you know, it was a casual remark. I said, I would love to do that. He said, do what? I said, play the keyboards. I'd love to be able to do that. Uh, we're just sitting there with a drink. He said, no, you wouldn't. I said, <laughs> I was a bit taken aback, you know, because I felt myself an authority on my own opinions, you know, so I said, <laughs> I said, uh, but I would. He said, no, you wouldn't. And we went on in this way for some time, you know. <laughs> and um, he said, no, no, he said, uh, he said, if you would love to do this, you'd be doing it. Uh, he said, to do what I do, I practice six to eight hours every day and I play every night. And I do that because I love it. I couldn't do it if I didn't. He said, I think what you mean is you like the idea of it. So I was a bit startled, really, because it was a casual social comment, frankly. I didn't, didn't mean to be sort of cauterized in this way socially, but, but he, he made a good point. You know, that you, it's that point at which passion meets um, a natural facility. Now, the reason I wanted to, to explore all of this is because, as I say, my experience is that most people don't have the experience of finding this configuration in their lives. I don't say it's true of you, but it's true of a lot of people, and yet some do. And they're in all sorts of different fields. Now, I've had a lifelong commitment, as I guess some of you know, to education. And um, I think education is partly responsible for diverting people from their talents. I don't mean individual teachers or particular schools. It's not a problem of teachers or particular schools. It's a system problem. It's to do with the ideology of education in which people are working. 
the things they take for granted as being true. In many cases, in my opinion, uh, things that are not true. One of them, for example, is this extraordinary distinction which still plagues us, which, by the way, the RSA, I think, has always pioneered against. This awful distinction people make between academic and vocational education. I really think it's, an, it's a dreadful mistake to both make the distinction and then to privilege academic work above what's called vocational work. You know, as if doing things with your hands isn't really to be discussed in, in polite public. Um, that you know, real education is about a certain type of abstract conceptual knowledge and that they're different in some way. I was, uh, I'll just give you an example of why I think it's so um, uh, awkward and pernicious. I was in San Francisco uh, a week ago signing a book. Actually, I was signing a number of books, you'd be interested. I mean, I, <laughs> I didn't fly to San Francisco to sign this one book. You know, I was, there were many books. But uh, there was a line of people uh, whose books I was signing. And uh, what I find is you know, people tell you their stories. And you, you, get, you get kind of adept at, at having a one-minute conversation with somebody for as long as it takes to sign their name, really. Uh, so you're not holding people up. But this guy stopped in front of me. And I'd been kind of having a little rant about academic and vocational education. And he said, um, he said I was really, he bought the book, and he, so I was prepared to speak to him. And he said, I, he said, this is a, he said, I, I loved what you were saying, by the way. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a fireman in Danville with the fire service. I said, oh, fantastic. Um, how long have you been a fireman? He said, well, my working life. I said, and when did you know you wanted to be a fireman? He said, I always wanted to be a fireman. I said, I know kids say they want to be a fireman. I always wanted to be a fireman. Uh, all the way through school. He said, but nobody ever encouraged me. He said, I was always, I was in a school where the whole thing was to get to college and do a degree. He said, I never want to do that. I want to be a fireman. And he said, I was always made to feel bad about it. He said, in fact, I had one teacher who made a fool of me one day in the class uh, when I, we were talking about careers. And he said, I, what I want to do. And he told me I was stupid and that I would never amount to anything. He said, and a few months ago, I saved his life. <laughs> you know, I pulled him out of a crash gave him CPR, and he said, and I've also I saved his wife's life as well. He said, I think he thinks better of me. <laughs> but you know what I mean? This, this insistence on a certain type of talent um, automatically uh, pushes other sorts of talents further away you know, from the center of attention in education. Now, the book, from one point of view, is, very, uh, is, is personal in the sense it's, it, it has lots of personal stories. But it's more than that. Um, it's not really just a book of reminiscences by people who are doing things they like to do. Uh, there are three arguments that run through it, which I think are also central to what happens at the RSA. Um, and they're these. The first is that what I'm trying to articulate in the book, I believe, is essential to human fulfillment. That finding a purpose in the work we do or the way that we spend our time which resonates deeply with who we think we are is an essential part of knowing who we are. That in a way, if you don't know what you can do, you don't really know what you might be. So it's about that. And people are in the book from all kinds of different fields. Um, one of the people in the book is a guy called Bart Connor. Have you ever heard of Bart Connor? Bart Connor is a fantastic guy. Um, I met him in Oklahoma a few years ago. Uh, Bart, Bart found that when he was six, he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. We don't know how he found this out. Um, I think it just fell over, but he, he could do it. And he said it wasn't much use to anybody, you know, but it was a source of social celebration. Uh, and then he found he could walk up and down stairs on his hands as well. You know, again, not a great deal of use, you know, but socially you know, uh, engaging. He said, you know, whenever the party's at the house, you know... <laughs> The conversation lulled, you know, his dad would say, Bart, just do the hands thing there, would you, man? You just you know, <laughs> do the stairs. Anyway, um, when he was, I think, about eight, it, this is in Morton Grove, Illinois, his mother took him to the local gymnastics center downtown with the school gymnastics teacher because she thought this was interesting, that he could do this and seem to enjoy it. So they took him to the big gymnastics center. And he said he walked into this gymnastics center, to this gymnasium, and he said, it took my breath away. You know, there were ropes, uh, vaulting horses, wall bars, trampolines. He said, to me, it was a combination of Disneyland and Santa's Grotto. He said, it was intoxicating. Now, you see, here again, I do not have this feeling 
when I walk into a gymnasium. You know, I do not find it intoxicating. I want to get intoxicated you know, if, I, <laughs> if I go into a gymnasium. But he found it intoxicating, and he started going regularly. Ten years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics, representing America in the male gymnastics squad. He became the most decorated male gymnast in American history. Uh, he now lives in Norman, Oklahoma. He's married to Nadia Comaneci, if you recall, the perfect ten. Uh, they have this extraordinary gymnastics school, and he and Nadia are leading figures in the world's Special Olympics movement. So between them, they've helped to liberate you know, the athletic capabilities of tens of thousands of people with disabilities. I think it's a fantastic story. But there are a couple of things I just want to say about it. You know, the first is that you know, some, his mother could not have anticipated that that would be the trajectory that his life would follow. It wasn't like at the age of eight, she saw him doing this thing on the stairs you know, and thought, well, he can do that. You know, there's, there's this girl in Romania, you know, maybe. Um, what she did was encourage his talent, and the talent created the opportunities to which he then responded. And this to me is fundamentally important because it illustrates something, um, I think, which is essential to our understanding of how education should work. That life, our own lives, are not linear. Uh, it's much more appropriate, I think, to think not of linear metaphors for human growth and development, but of organic metaphors. That our lives evolve around the responses we have to the opportunities that meet us, and we in turn reciprocate with them. So his life became transformed by the investment he made in his own passion for gymnastics. He could not have planned the trajectory. Now I say this because we still run our education systems as if life is linear. We run them as if it's mechanistic. This is one of the reasons so many things get phased out of education, because people say, well, you'll never get a job if you do that. You know, things are dropped off the end because they don't meet the linear assumption. I came across a, a policy paper a while ago when I came, went to Los Angeles, which seemed to me to really exemplify this. You know, we are obsessed with getting people to universities at the moment. It's like the whole job is to get to university. Why? I don't mean you shouldn't go, but I don't think everybody should go and have that type of education. People should go and do other things, or not go now. You know, do something else for a bit till they understand it. But I came across this um, policy paper which said that it was entitled, College Begins in Kindergarten. No, it doesn't. <laughs> do <you know? laughs> it doesn't. I mean, if we had more time, we could go into this, but time is short, so it, it doesn't. Kindergarten begins in kindergarten. You know, there's, the guy who runs the Ark in Dublin made a fantastic comment. I can't just remember his name now. He's a wonderful man. But he said a three-year-old is not half a six-year-old. A six-year-old is not half a 12-year-old. You know, but, you know, it, I'm sure it's true in London. It's true in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Parents are competing to get their children into particular kindergartens. Competing. You know, kids are being interviewed at three. <laughs> For kindergarten, you're presumably producing CVs, you know, <laughs> you know, sitting in front of unimpressed selection boards, flicking through this thing, you know, well, this is it, you know, you've, you've been around for 36 months and this is it, you know, you've, you've, you've achieved nothing, you know, you've spent the first six months breastfeeding from what I can tell, it's, it's an outrage. You see, it's preposterous, isn't it? And yet the whole system of education is planned as if it's a linear process whose outcomes you can foretell. You simply cannot. And on this basis, many people along the way are being detached from their natural interests in the interests of this faulted model of progress. So, one, it's important for personal fulfillment. The second major argument here is that I think it's essential for the health of our communities. That if you have people aggregated in large numbers, who feel disaffected, dislocated from a sense of purpose, with no social investment, either in themselves or the communities of which they're part. Well, we know the price that we pay for this. I made an analogy, I think, the last time I was here at the RSA, because I believe it strongly, between the crisis in the world's natural resources, which I believe is real and severe, and the crisis which I think this book is about, which is the crisis in the world's human resources. And I think the origins are the same, they lie in industrialism and in a particular intellectual preoccupation. Um, and the analogy is even stronger than that, because the current status quo 
serves the interests of massive commercial interests in just the same way as the oil-based economy met the needs of massive commercial interests. Uh, it, it, I know it's not so true in, in uh, the UK, but in America there's a, an alleged outbreak of ADHD, you know, attention deficit disorder. This is, a, I think, a false epidemic. I don't mean to say there's no such thing, but according to the figures in America, in the mid-80s, half a million kids were diagnosed with ADHD, and it's now nearly 8 million. You know, well, this is a bonanza for the, for the drug companies and the pharmaceutical companies. Testing is a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, often uh, uh, conducted uh, in the hands of people who know very little about education, you know, just to keep the system running. So I think the analogy is exact. And I think I said last time, you know, in America, for example, in California, uh, I think the price we pay is enormous. Uh, next year, 2010, in America, spending, total spending on the state prison system will overtake spending on higher education. Does that make any kind of sense? I don't know what the figures are here, but it's a ludicrous conception of, of, of human capacity, isn't it? I just don't think there are that many bad people. You know, I mean, I mean, there are bad people, but not so many. There are people in bad circumstances who make bad judgments, but not that many naturally bad people. I mean, there aren't that many psychopaths, I don't think, you know? Actually, you don't need that many psychopaths, truthfully. I mean, I mean one goes a long way, I find, don't you, really? <laughs> You know, honestly, if, you meet, if you meet two psychopaths in the same day, that's a bad day, really, isn't it? I'm saying, dear diary, you know, <laughs> what a day. <laughs> um, so I think it's essential for the health of our communities. It, to me, speaks to a broader conception of human resources. And the, the final way in which I think the analogy holds is this, that human talent, human ability, like the world's natural resources, is often buried deep. It's not just lying around on the surface. You have to go looking for it. And that's true of many of the people in this book. Something happened which enabled them to develop this particular talent. They met somebody, or there was a confluence of circumstances, or there was a mentor, somebody, who spotted something, or they came across it. It's not just obvious where your talent might be. And that's why I think so many people don't know what their talents are, because they've never actually come upon them yet. And the final point is, I think this is a hard-headed economic argument. Um, that you know, as we look into the future and can't predict even two weeks out you know, what the economies may look like, what jobs people will do, uh, how the economies may evolve, what, what sort of um, economic uh, progress we'll make, investing in the old model seems to me to, to be absolutely absurd. You know, the, the old model is, is predicated on a particular view of intelligence and talent, and I think for the future we need to evolve systems of education and of organisational um, planning and of community development, which are based on a model of diversity rather than of conformity. And that's, in the end, what this book is about. It's to try and promote a, a broader view of the diversity of human talent in all of its many forms. So the first two bits of that, it's about, ta about ability and it's about aptitude. It's, all, uh, it's also about attitude. I have a chapter in the book called Do You Feel Lucky? Because a lot of the people in the book say that they owe their success to luck. But actually, luck is a bit of a get-out, I think. Uh, random things happen to all of us. That's really not the point. It's not what happens to you, I think, that makes the difference in your life. It's what you make of what happens, how you meet these circumstances and what you do about it. And it's about opportunity. Um, you know, there aren't that many pearl divers in the Sahara, truthfully, and not much bronco riding in the Antarctic. You know, it's about cultural circumstances. Things prevent this happening. Quite severe things happening. Uh, I have a chapter called, What Will They Think? One of the, I, I think of these as circles of constraint. One of the things that stops us doing what we might want to do is our own self-censorship, a fear that we'll fall flat on our face, that, well, you know, it, me, I'm not even entitled to it. A second, I think, is other people's attitudes, friends and family, often well-intentioned. I tell the story in the book of Paolo Coelho. I didn't um, meet him either, but uh, I mean, the, that's two of the people I mentioned who I didn't actually get to meet for the book, but the rest I did. But Paolo Coelho, you know, the writer of The Alchemist, one of the world's top-selling authors now, wanted to be a writer from when he was a kid. And his parents heavily disapproved of this, and when he got to be a teenager and persisted in this idea, and when he approached university age, uh, he, he, he wouldn't give up on the idea. They actually had him committed to a mental institution um, where he had uh, three series of electroconvulsive therapy to try and get this idea out of his head. Uh, anyway, he didn't get it out of his head, and he carried on to be Paolo Coelho, the person we know. Now, uh, most of us don't have that. You know, most of us aren't actually plugged into the mains, you know, to, to, to stop this happening. But, um, but f there are all forms of tacit disapproval that, that prevent us moving forward. It can be the raised eyebrow of a friend, you know, or a, uh, a, a group culture. What, you, seriously? 
What, you would do that? Oh, well, okay. You know, it's that kind of... Or cultural constraints about the roles of women or, um, or other communities. So I'm not trying to say that this is easy, um, but I'm saying it's essential, and that there are things we can do, particularly in the systematic process that we put forward um, through education and, and organization of, of um, communities, that can assist it. So the final thing I just want to say is, you know, I've had a lifetime of interest in education and human possibility. But in the end, what it seems to me essential to emphasize is that education is not um, a mechanistic process and organizations are not mechanisms. You know, if you look at the organizational, the management chart of most organizations, it looks like a wiring diagram. And it all kind of suggests that these are like mechanisms and they're not. Human life and human communities are much more like organisms in the sense that we flourish under certain conditions and we fade under certain conditions. And our success is always synergistic with our environment, as it is with, with a plant. You know, that a successful plant is successful throughout, not just in one part. And its success depends on the environment in which it lives and its enrichment of the environment. And I find this is true in the human field. I know schools across this country, organizations which are wonderfully healthy and vital, who enrich their environment and the people in it. The problem happens when we start to depersonalize education. And it continues to, to impress and depress me uh, when successive governments don't get it. When they keep acting as if you can reform education by just tweaking the mixture and standardizing everything uh, and getting back to basics. You know, I, I wish politicians who talk about getting back to basics understood what they were saying. You know, I think we should get back to basics, but there are, there are some basics which go well beyond what they believe. One is that education is about personal growth. It is. Somebody once said to me the other day, is this book, does this owe some of its ideas to the 1960s? I said, yes. And to the 18th century, and to the 1920s, <laughs> and to the ancient Greeks, I hope. Some ideas are worth repeating. It is about human flourishing. But it's also about recognizing that education and our communities are part of cultures and they're not independent and insulated from them. So there has to be a cultural commitment. And it's also about economic development, and that has to be synergistic with all of the rest. But at the heart of it, the elemental bit of it, is a different conception of human possibility. And that's really what the book tries to be about as a basis for a different type of conversation. I came across, I'm sure you know this, I came across a great uh, uh, piece a while ago from Michael Angelo. It's quite old, this isn't recent. He didn't just say this, you know, it's like, like this just in, you know, <laughs> from, from Michael Angelo. Uh, but he talked about the making of the statue, the David, and, uh, and he said, you know, I did not make this sculpture. I didn't make the David. Um, I revealed it. It was there already in the stone. I can't take credit for it. I revealed it. Uh, and he said, it's an easy thing to do because all you have to do is to remove the bit, the bits that aren't the David. And there it is. That's all you do as a sculpture. Remove the bits that aren't the David. Um, and I feel it's a, it's, a, it's a good analogy for us. We should start removing the bits that aren't us uh, and allow the bits that are us to shine forward. He also said something very interesting. He said, the problem for human beings is often that not that we aim too high and fail, it's that we aim too low and succeed. And the book is an appeal to aim high and to give us some sense of what success might look like. And I think it comes to that final bit, that finding your passion does change everything. Thank you. So where does responsibility, duty, ethics fit into your kind of account of the way in which we uh, lose those things, which we... Get, get to the real us, as it were. Well, if, 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 not, you know, these aren't mutually exclusive ideas. Um, the, uh, I define, we're actually going back to the All Our Futures report of 10 years ago now, um, but slightly refined, I, I thought, or simplified. Uh, the definition I have in the, in the book, actually in the work I do for creativity, right, is uh, that creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. And I think... The three key things about that are those keywords. It's a process. You know, it's not an event. To, to do something creative is a job of work. You know, it's something that unfolds as you work on the idea and evolve them. Uh, it's not just random acts of inspiration, though they may have some part in it. It is about coming up with fresh ideas, uh, but it's also judging the value and worth of them. And you know, some good ideas, some fresh ideas, are not terribly good. Um, and I think what we've seen, uh, if you're talking about the, the recent financial collapse is um, not so much an act of creativity, it's a kind of mass hallucination. Um, you know, that this was a whole enterprise that was built on thin air, uh, from what you can tell. And the problem here wasn't that people were being original, it's that they completely lost their critical judgment. You know, they, 
left out entirely the essential counterpart of original thinking, which is evaluating the, the use of these ideas. Um, and, you know, I mean, I don't have more to say than all of us would say about that. But the, the problem was not that they were being creative, it's that they weren't being critical. And um, I think if those two things don't hold together, then you're in, you know, you, you've, you've created a problem for all of us, and that's simply what's happened. But now, that doesn't mean, therefore, we can't afford to be creative again. But we need to be creative responsibly. You know, we actually do need to remake these systems now, but having learned the lessons that we've, we should have learned from this sort of, sort of fiasco of the past few months. Can we um, uh, turn to the issue of education? Because um, you've been around debates about education. You've seen the cycles that policymakers go through over time. Um, we're very likely to have a Conservative government um, elected um, next year and, and saying some very interesting things. But there, there is one aspect of its policy which kind of worries me, which is that it is precisely asserting this kind of back-to-basics view. Um, I heard uh, it's very talented spokesman on education say the other day that the diplomas are fine as long as they're just for the, pe the people who aren't academic. So there's a, a very strong push from a party that's likely soon to be in power for a reassertion of the academic vocational divide, um, a view that practical learning, that creative learning, that approaches like opening minds are some kind of horrible middle class conspiracy to dumb down. I, I guess my question to you is, is what insight do you have having been round and round these debates about why it is there's so much circularity to the education debate, why it is we find it so hard to move to move on, and why, in a way, it's so easy to appeal in a rather kind of reactionary way to, the, to public opinion in, uh, on education? Well, I think um, you, you're, you're right. I mean, these debates go round and round, and, it, and it's, it's exasperating. Um, I mean, don't vote for them is, is one thing I would suggest. Um, but, um, but, but I think, I think it's a serious issue, you know, that, that this is not, I don't think people are acting in bad faith, truthfully. Um, I don't think they're um, deliberately trying to run the country off a cliff when they say these things. The problem is much deeper than that. It's, I think of it as ideological. Uh, what I mean is, and, and what all this is about, all, what I think my work has been about, is trying to challenge the, 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 the fundamental uh, assumptions on which people make these arguments. You know, when people say get back to basics, it's the thing they don't do. They just default to what they think is common sense. And they think you don't have to reflect on education because they went to school themselves once. And so it's a done deal. You know, everything about education is obvious. And the trouble is, most things that are obvious turn out not to be true. So my, my feeling about this is that, um, uh, well, I, I remember when, do you remember when the national curriculum was introduced? Uh, it was, I think, well, I remember Kenneth Baker was the the Secretary of State at the time, and essentially he, he really proposed the curriculum he had when he was at school as a boy. You know, it was really the curriculum of St. Paul's, you know, that uh, the rest of the country was required to, to follow. Um, because he defaulted, you know, to, um, to the way he used to be educated. And, you know, I always worry when people say, well, it didn't do me any harm. I said, but, but look at you. <laughs> look at the state of you. I mean, why would we... <laughs> but, but what I mean is... I think there is an evolution here, but I think you have to have a sensible view of the time frame. These are big cultural shifts that are happening. I think there's a general paradigm shift happening. There's a transformation. Even this conversation, you know, is an important part of that. And you have to have a theory of change. You know, um, I think one of them is that the changes we're talking about will not only come about if we focus on trying to change the minds of governments. Ministers come and ministers go. Uh, they have all their own interests at, at stake. They want some quick wins. They want to impress the electric, electorate and the Daily Mail. Uh, we know that. They're more interested in that on the whole than the, the health of the, the country's schools, for the most part, in my opinion. Um, but so we have to work with governments, and we have to get them, I think, to think the right things and do the right things. But it's equally important that we work at the ground level, encourage people who are doing the work, and empower them and, and help them to believe that it's important that they do these things. You see, the thing I get exasperated about, as I think we all do, is if, you, if you're working in education, you're facing 40 kids, you know, in a, a high crime area of a city, um, it doesn't help you to have these pronouncements coming, you know, from Westminster, from ex-public school people, saying, let's get back to basics. You know, it doesn't help. It, it shows, I think, an appalling misunderstanding of the realities of education. And what's so annoying is they think they're, they're being hard-headed. Um, 
you know, what if we know anything about education is that people are only transformed if they're engaged. And you can only engage them if you look into their eyes and see how they work and how they think and how they are involved in this work. My daughter, just very quickly, uh, uh, my daughter, for example, uh, loved French until she got this other French teacher at school, the school in Los Angeles. And, um, uh, and I went to, at the end of the year, I went, I went along to chat to the, to the teachers, and, and this French teacher said, you know, I'm a bit worried about Kate's progress in French. There are five kids in this class, by the way. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, she's, it's her attitude. I said, what do you mean her attitude? She said, well, she seems bored all the time. She seems bored all the time. I, I said, really? I said, do you have any theories about this? She said, how do you mean? I said, well, could it be boring? <laughs> you know, answer. Just putting it out there, you know. And she said, well, you know, we do try to make, make it as interesting as possible, but she said, I think you have to accept that some aspects of learning a language are, are just boring. Well, you see, she shouldn't be teaching if she thinks that, you know? Because nothing is inherently boring. I mean, I'm not aware of legions of French teenagers abandoning French because it's so tedious, you know, and, and moving to Copenhagen so they can speak Danish. I mean, that's... I said, no, I said, no, I said, you are boring. You know, I mean, I've been with you for five minutes and I'm stultified, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, getting back to basics, includes recognizing that great education requires great teaching. It's not enough to know your discipline. A great teacher has to know how to engage people, and great teachers do. And what really I think most people find exasperating when, is when well-intentioned, if they are, uh, politicians decide they're gonna take control of a, a process they don't know, uh, promote ideas they only half understand, uh, and remove the one thing that improves education, which is the discretion and creativity of the people actually doing the work. And I think, it's, I think it's an historic battle, and I really encourage you to engage with it, because I think it's important that we don't let this drag on for another generation. I really do. Um, OK, I'm, I'm just going to reinforce that point and, and, then, and then open it up just to, to say that, uh, having been on both sides of this debate, uh, you can see why it is so difficult to get the right kind of conversation. So for example, the RSA has its Opening Minds curriculum, which is taught in over 200 schools. But it's a framework. It doesn't specify everything that you need to do. And so some, school, some schools do it in an incredibly ambitious way and in a really, really good way. And other schools do it in a much more modest way. And some schools don't do it very well at all. Yeah. Which means that those people who don't like opening minds can hunt around and find the schools that don't do it very well and say, look, opening minds doesn't work. And if you're sitting in Downing Street or a department or a conservative central office, you think, oh, we can't possibly have that because it doesn't always work. But the point is, in order for it to be something which always worked, it wouldn't work. Um, and I understand that now. I didn't understand it when I was in government. I want to apologise to you and to the world, but yes, um, I do understand it now. Do you, do you feel better now? I do. <laughs> I, I can't think of anyone better to confess to, Ken, <laughs> than you. Okay. But, um, but, but I could just say, but part of it is, I think, people who, who do occupy these positions, and they're important positions, is that, is that they seem to c confuse you know, improving education with improving rail track, you know, or improving the drainage system. You know, that if we just standardise everything, It'll hum along sensibly forever. And the fundamental mistake is that education is a human system. It works on relationships and feelings and motivations and aspirations. And every school is different. Every classroom is different because they've got people in there. You know, um, you know, the whole thing about raising reading scores and so on, it's important. Uh, of course it's important, but it won't happen if kids aren't engaged in reading and being interested. I can't think there's a kid in the country who gets up in the morning thinking, how can I raise my school's reading standards? You know, I mean, what can I do to contribute? You know, they'll only do it if they're engaged, and that's the job of teaching. And so I, I, if, you, if you have had this moment, Matthew, I, I, I'd like us all to be quiet and share it for a moment, because <laughs> no, no, I, no, I seriously think it's important. And the RSA has always been about that, I think, about recognizing that talent and capability are at the heart of social change. And it's not about standardizing, but about raising standards. And that's something different, I think.